My name is Jamie Larock. I'm a part of the global training team with Altium. So anything that has to do with the training content, on-site training, e-learning, all that stuff is, is part of our efforts. Uh, what we're going to be talking about specifically in this session is complete design documentation. So we're going to be looking at output jobs, how to reuse those. We're going to be looking at the draftsman document for any drawings as well. So that's pretty much what we're going to be covering in this specific session and how do we re, uh, reuse those as templates as well. So just by a quick raise of hands, I like to make it kind of interactive. I don't think anyone wants to hear me talk by myself for two hours, so please throw me a bone here. Um, just by a raise of hands, is everyone mostly tasked with generating outputs, generating drawings, generating uh, PCB documentation, dimensions, callouts? For the most part, everyone, everyone's responsible for that. Okay, good. So it's going to be pertinent to what you guys are doing. We're going to be looking at the output jobs first, and then we'll dive into the draftsman document. Um, who here has heard of output jobs and is currently using the output job document? Perfect. So I like to hear. So some of this stuff isn't necessarily going to be new to you. If you already uh, know how to essentially use those output jobs and reuse them, at least you'll be rest assured that you're using it properly. So that's another thing that we want to look at today as well. For the draftsman document, who here is using that? Okay, so about half to three quarters. So we're going to be looking at that as well, which is good. Um, so just to give you a quick rundown of what we'll be looking at at the session, uh, I will respect everybody's lunch hour, and I will not go over 12 o'clock, I promise, okay? So I know I'm the real MVP. Thank you very much. I'll make sure everyone gets their food on time. So the first thing we're going to be looking at is some traditional and existing methods to generating outputs. So aside from the output jobs, how are we generating our Gerbers, our NC drill files, and what are the concerns that come along with that? Uh, some of the manual labor that's involved, some of the human error that can happen with that kind of stuff. Then we're going to be looking at the automated features that already exist within Altium Designer that we can reuse. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the output jobs and the draftsman document. So we're going to look at kind of not the theory, but kind of the real world pros and cons of using all of it. And then we're going to dive right into it and we're going to look at it. After that, I want to share a personal experience with you of a previous uh, place I worked at where I could have used these tools. And earlier in my career, I did not know they existed. Uh, so that's kind of my own fault for being uh, you know, naive or not knowing that these things existed. So I wanted to share you an experience, share with you an experience that I had of how these tools could have benefited me when I was doing this type of work. And we're going to save the Q&A for the end. Uh, I just kind of want to have like an open discussion. I'm going to hang around here. Whatever questions you guys have, uh, I certainly want to answer them. Anything from a technical perspective of can it do this, can it do that, there may be things that I might not be able to answer for you. But I want you guys to know that if you give me something to work on, whether it be notes or something you want to figure out, I'm dedicated to getting those, uh, answers, uh, those uh, answers to your questions, OK? So I might not have an answer for everything today. I hope I do. Uh, but in the event that I don't, just rest assured that uh, I'll get those answers for you, OK? And then you guys can go off and have lunch, which we're all excited about. So I kind of already spoke about how you know, asking you guys who's using the output job document. 75% of you are already using it, which is great. Uh, so what we're going to look at is some traditional methods or some concerns that can arise if we're not using the output jobs. So what are some traditional things that we look at from the output job perspective? So we look at individual output generation. So before using output jobs, what would be the way that we would generate some of these outputs? You go into the file menu, you look at fabrication and assembly, you generate your Gerbers, and you got to configure them right then and there one by one, right? So that was the traditional way, or even if output job uh, document existed and you never used it, that was probably the way that you were generating these files. The issue with, the, with that is that you have to configure them right then and there. You might not get any standardization because <coughs> I'm assuming that 90% of you here have a team of three or five people plus, right, along with your team. And I think anything in life, everybody likes to do things their own way. Some people are more stubborn than others. 
and sometimes that documentation is not standardized. So what happens is, is you might have, uh, you know, Courtney who's going to configure it a certain way, but then you're going to have James who's going to do it a certain way. And if they're dealing with the same fab house, let's say, the fab house is going to get two different documents, right? And that's not really acceptable. So using these traditional methods of the single output generation, packaging this up, and sending it to your fab or your assembly house is not necessarily anything wrong with that, but once again, we have these concerns. It's not going to be configured the same, and it's a manual process, and we can't reuse it. So if you go to the file menu and you generate a Gerber, what are you going to do for your next project? You're just going to hope you do it the same way again, right? So that's where the output job is kind of going to save that. And we're going to look at how we can save it as a template as well. So there's, going to be, there's multiple ways you can reuse the document, and I'm going to show you each and every way. So that's one of the challenges that we have. You guys all know what an output job is for the most part. It's a document that's going to act as a centralized location and interface where we can output all of those documents. So for those of you who currently are not using it, instead of generating one by one, it's a dedicated interface where we can essentially generate all of the outputs necessary along with the documentation. So one of the benefits to this as well is that it's automated. Uh, it's essentially a one-stop shop, and it's one click. Whenever you generate your container for your PDF, it doesn't matter how many PDF outputs are in that container. All you have to do is hit generate content, and you know all of your documents are going to be generated, right? So that's one of the benefits that we see with the output job. So I didn't want this to be a death by PowerPoint, so uh, we're definitely going to just dive right into looking at the traditional methods of how we would generate the outputs. We'll then look at the output job, job itself, and we'll kind of break it down in a level of organization that gives us kind of an extra level. Because right now, how many of you generate your outputs and you have your project outputs folder and everything is in that one folder? Sort of, right? So when you generate Gerbers, you're going to have like 15 files. And if everything is in there, your pick and place, your NC drill files, all that fun stuff, you know it's in that folder, but now you have to skim through 20 different documents. So I'm going to show you a different way where we actually can set up specific folders for specific outputs to separate that, whether it be fabrication, assembly, and documentation. I don't care if my schematic prints are included with my Gerbers because I'm not sending schematic prints to my fab house. Right, so we want to separate that. So we'll go ahead and get right into it. So here I have a pretty generic four-layer board, uh, a lot of 3D models. We have our dimensions. We have surface mount devices. We have through-hole devices. Could be something that's very popular, something similar to what all of you are doing. So when we look at some of the traditional methods that we generate the outputs without the output job, we go to the file menu, we're in fabrication outputs, assembly outputs, and maybe we'll generate our bill of materials from the reports menu. So if you're not using the output job, that's what essentially you would do. So let's go ahead and look at the out job document. Just like any other schematic PCB document, it's as simple as adding a new document to your project. And you'll see here we have the output job file. As I mentioned, centralized location where everything is uh, encapsulated into this one document. The way you use the out job document, and once again, some of you may already know this, and if you already know it, at least you'll know you're using it the right way. So take that kind of as a, as a note for this part of the presentation. Your first step's going to be to select your variant. So if you have a variation of your design, which PCB do we want to generate outputs for? Do we want to generate one output for the PCB? Do we want to have individual outputs for each variation? So your first step is going to be selecting your variant choice. Your second uh, stage or region that we're working with in this output job, obviously, is the, uh, the output documentation right here. So, Aside from the traditional method of using it through the file menu, where I only have access to assembly and fabrication, let's call it 15 choices, I'd say there's probably upwards of 40 choices when you're using the output job. You can see for uh, documentation outputs, assembly outputs, we have way more options than we would if we weren't using this. And then the third step that you would take to generate and kind of store these files is through the output containers. 
How many people kind of manipulate or work with the output containers? Okay, perfect. So once again, some of this isn't going to be new. Uh, when I first, first started using the output job, I didn't really know what the output containers were because it kind of just gives me a little bit of information and I was kind of scared to change anything because I didn't have much experience at uh, that point in my life. And I just kind of kept everything, everything stored in the project's output folder by default, and that was it. So we're going to look at configuring that as well. So what we're going to see with this specific project is that I'll make a output container and a folder specifically, one for documentation, one for assembly, one for fabrication. So we're going to see how we can split up that level of organization uh, within our project folder. So we're not going to get too in-depth on the exact outputs themselves, configuring everything said and done, because most of you, I'm sure, know how to do that. But we'll look at some of the options that are available. So I'll start with my documentation output. In this scenario, I want to select schematic prints. Does anybody ever get confused when they see a couple options here? <laughs> yes? OK. So essentially how this works is you'll see the source document. So the poly schematic document is the source document that I have in my project that's only going to print that specific schematic. Now, when I look at project physical documents, I don't really know what that means. I'm kind of just hoping, yeah, sure, let's generate it and let's see what kind of schematic files are generated. So when you look at that bracketed option, and we'll see with the PCB document as well, the way I can break it down is two ways. One, it's a non-target specific option meaning that it's not referencing a specific source document. So if you want to set up your output job and save that out as a template, you would use that bracketed version. Now, when you look at the project physical documents, it's usually used whenever you have compiled schematics. So if you're using device, sheet, device sheets or if you have a multi-channel design, it's going to print the uh, physical schematics and not the logical. So with a multi-channel uh, design, you'll see that you essentially have two sets of designators, really. So if you're using device sheets or multi-channel, this option could benefit, for, benefit you because it's going to print all of the physical schematic documents. So in this scenario, I only have one schematic document, so it really wouldn't matter which choice I pick here. But since I'm going to be saving it out as a template anyways, I'll just pick the non-target specific option, and it's still going to work. Obviously, under the output description uh, column is where we can configure our options. If you double click here is where we configure all of the properties for that specific output. I personally like all the default options because of the bookmarks and everything for the schematic prints. So there's nothing really here for me to change specifically. So we're going to generate that in its own documentation container. For assembly outputs, once again, you'll see that PCB document option. It's non-target specific. It's used uh, if you want to reuse a template. And if you have multiple PCB documents in your project, you would see those options here. So we only have the one PCB, so I can go ahead and select that option, no problem. We can always configure these as well. Uh, for those of you who haven't necessarily gone in depth in this specific interface here, if you right click, you can add and remove layers as you wish for your printout. So if there's only a specific set of layers, whether it be mechanical, whether they be signal layers, uh, and the default options as well, this is kind of where you can manipulate your schematic to essentially give you the layers that you want. You don't have to stick with the typical top and bottom and, and so on. If you want to add some of those layers, just right click anywhere in here. We can remove, we can add, we can check out the properties, and so on. So in this scenario, it's actually going to do three printouts for me. I have three layer sets, uh, and they're all going to contain different uh, layers as well. If you want to check out the preferences, this is where you could actually toggle the colors for your schematic, and as well as if you want to enable or disable any mechanical layers as well. So I know previously I never really gone too in-depth into these preferences because I just wanted a surface mount through a hole. I have my signal layers, and away we go. So just know that these properties do exist. We'll click OK. And then fabrication, because it's the most common thing that we send out for our fab house, because we wouldn't necessarily have a board without one. We'll go ahead and generate some Gerbers. And also NC drill files. These are, once again, just two examples that we're going to be using. 
In the Gerbers, these options are going to be dependent on your fab house. They might tell you to change the resolution, or they might even tell you to enable specific layers. I always use the used on option for plot layers. Uh, who uses all layers? Who uses used on? What's most common for you guys? Used on or all layers? All layers? Okay. I never had any issues using the used on. Uh, it's never came back to me from the Gerber perspective that I was missing anything. So this option has always personally worked for me. And then for the NC drill files, the one thing that they had me generate was this DRL file. And once again, that's going to be dependent on the fab house as well. So all of this stuff you would essentially discuss with your fab house just to kind of ensure that you're generating the proper information. Cool. So we have them configured. We have the outputs added, but we didn't generate anything yet. They're just kind of sitting here. But I told you guys that I don't want to store everything within the default projects folder. So in the output containers, by default, you'll have three. You'll have one PDF, so anything that can be generated as a PDF, <laughs> schematic prints, PCB prints, anything that, like that that is in the native P, uh, PDF format will be saved through there. The folder structure is essentially anything that cannot be generated and brought up through something like a PDF. So if we look at Gerber's, you can't really open Gerber's in a PDF, or you, it's not necessarily meant to be that way. So the folder structure is essentially going to generate that output how it's supposed to be. And for the video, not very common. Is anybody doing PCB 3D videos? One few people, okay. So not very common, uh, but by default it's there, right? So this isn't going to work for me. So I'm going to remove all of the containers. And I'm essentially going to create my own because I also want to name them differently. So I'm going to add a new PDF output container because I know that my schematic prints are by PDF. So we'll call this documentation. We'll do another PDF for the assembly drawings because I know that uh, those are generated by PDFs as well. And for fabrication, I only have my Gerbers in NC drill so I can keep this as fabrication. So what's going to happen is that now I know where I can enable these outputs. You'll see these radio buttons under the enabled column. Uh, as you can tell, it's kind of a foolproof way of generating your outputs. Uh, once again, like I mentioned, if I want to generate the Gerber, well, you'll see here that it's actually not present. I can't generate a Gerber as a PDF. So I'm going to enable the first documentation output to the uh, documentation container. I will do the same for assembly, and I want these separate. And for fabrication, we can stick them under the same output container. So once again, raise of hands. Everyone's already doing this, right? Similar, right? Yeah, I, I have to generate uh, each individual layer so that, so that it doesn't override all of my uh, OK. So is that just for Gerber's or for everything, essentially? For everything. Right. Gotcha. OK. So what we can maybe look at later on is, uh, as we were talking with the other stuff, we can see how maybe we can move those files or maybe put them in a version control or something as well. Is going to be the name of the folder that it's going to go into? It's, it's no. I'm going to configure that once again. For me right now, the output container name is just essentially for me to know where I'm going to generate it. Whenever I specify the actual path of where the folder is going to be stored, I'm going to create a new folder for that. So it's perfect timing because I'm going to show it right now. Okay. So I have one thing yeah. about naming these is it's helpful to say uh, in parentheses use variant or no variant. Perfect. Typically, the fabrication file, you don't want to use the variant. And the assembly files, you yeah. do want to use the variant. So it's very useful to, re, you know, to put up there use variant or uh, no yeah, so, so in this scenario, let's say we're doing schematic prints and we have a variant. We could add an output container that has the variant for the do not install parts. And that way we know that when we're generating those schematic prints for that variant, we could do that. Or if you want to come back to the first step of the output itself, we can choose how we want to set up the options for the variant. But that is a good point. If you want to keep the variant choice uh, when we're generating the outputs the same and just create a new container for the variant, that could 
very well work as well. So that's good. So we still haven't generated, but we're essentially ready to go. The only thing I'm going to change is the actual location of where I'm going to store these. So if you hit the change button here, there's a little bit of information that was a little intimidating for me at first. Like I was saying, I didn't really want to mess around with this too much. Uh, and we were also storing things on a shared drive. So that's another thing where you guys are going to be sharing these, docu these uh, outputs in a shared drive. So I'm going to show that in a second as well. So I don't want to do the default release. I want to do a manual release. So this is where I'm going to specify where it's going to be stored. I know that my project currently resides in this demo data folder. So by default, I know that that's the proper location. The second choice where it says none is where we can choose how we want the naming convention of our folders to be. Do we want to name it documentation? So as you were uh, saying, Ronnie, that if I wanted to just pick container name, this would pick the documentation name. But maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I want to have a folder within it that's named something else. So I could use the container name. I've just been using the custom folder name because it gives you the option to name it what you wish. So in that scenario, those two uh, options would essentially be the same thing. For the container type, you don't necessarily want to name it PDF because that doesn't give you any information on what it, it, what it actually is. I want to know that my documentation outputs are in there. So I'm going to name it documentation, and I don't want it to be named job one because that doesn't tell me anything. Right? I want to have a, sp a specific name for this. So we can go in here and we can name it uh, schematic prints. So that way I know this specific PDF will be a schematic print. Click OK. Now we're going to have to do that for each container, right? Because I said that I want three separate folders. I don't want everything under one folder. If I'm sending something to the assembly house, I don't want to worry about all the other stuff. Yes, sir? OK. Yeah, you could. The only thing with the output container right now is that when you're generating that specific, this specific PDF, I can't give it multiple names. So in that scenario, you can generate multiple schematics. Would it follow the same naming convention as your schematics? So even if you just generated one schematic print PDF, it would have the name of the schematics in the one PDF anyways. So it would generate all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you could do them individually. It would be more of a labor intensive process to specifically fit what you would want. In this specific naming convention, it's just one PDF with all the documents. Um, so we may need to look at another level of organization for each individual naming of the schematic for you. So if you want to talk about it a little bit more, come see me afterwards as well. So yep. Does it add that, um, so that schematic prints, would that be behind your, your naming of the schematic file? That so it's going to be separate from the name of the schematic file itself. So you'll notice that whenever I go to open up this PDF, it's going to be, the PDF will be named schematic print. That's what it would be. Yeah. And then when we open up that schematic itself, it would show the naming of each schematic. I hope I answered that properly. But it, we'll, we'll show it. And if you still have some questions, please let me know. I don't, I don't want you guys leaving here empty handed and thinking, wow, this guy knew nothing off the top of his head, right? It always happens where if you do a demo or if you do a training, they're like, oh, well, we do things a certain way. And I was like, well, I'm going to have to dive into this a little bit because everyone's doing something different. We have 45 people in the room. It could have 45 different naming conventions, right? So please, please don't be shy. And I'm not a liar. I will get you an answer, and I promise. And I hope you can trust me on that. If not, well, that's my fault for not seeming trustworthy. Perfect. So once again, we're just specifying the path. I'll use the container name on this one just to give you an idea, Ronnie, that we can choose that as well. So here, I can name this, uh, what do we have here? Assembly drawings. How about some custom, custom scripts that go into the project output? Okay. I mean, the output, the output directory yeah. run all of my scripts okay. at one time. And because I, I have many restrictions on that, and some I have to change. 
Yeah. And then push, also push all of the data that's in the Alfield folder into another folder like uh, Mentor Graphics did. Right. So you're just running the script to get you that extra level of organization. Yeah. yeah. You're much smarter than I am. <laughs> yeah, please do, because I'm interested in the stuff that you were talking about earlier as well. Please come see me. Okay, for fabrication, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to point to that project folder, because I still want to store everything within the project folder. That's fine. Here, let's go ahead and name it fabrication. Now, this is where I essentially wouldn't change the other two options, and I'll show you why after. So it's going to take the output type, whether that be a Gerber NC drill file, whatever the case may be, and from there it's going to store that in its own folder. So I don't want to have my NC drill files and my Gerber files together. I still want to have those separate. So for the output type, I would personally leave it default. Once again, there's 45 different other opinions we can have here as well and I'll show you what it looks like in the actual output itself. So the output name and the type for fabrication, I'd usually just leave the same. And now we're ready to generate these. For those of you that are using a shared network drive or you have all the files on a server, you might be more inclined to select the generate and publish option versus setting the uh, server folder under generate content. So if you go to the managing publishing, it's going to bring up the schematic preferences where you can add a specific destination, whether it be uh, an FTP or something uh, that you guys have set up. So for those of you that are using shared network drive and you want to put something in a specific place, maybe it's behind a firewall, maybe you're working with someone external, uh, that's where you would add this destination for the publishing destination something that not always used very commonly. I've never had to use it in the past, but I do know that this is very helpful for some people. So we can go ahead and generate the content. Yeah, so uh, just one second, I'll generate this. And I'm hoping I can answer your question on the naming of the schematic. The name of the schematic itself is the poly schematic doc, but I named my PDF as schematic prints. So it's always going to reference the document name that'll never change. It's just essentially what I was naming the PDF. If that still doesn't answer, please come see me after. Um, Carl, you're saying the generate and publish. Yeah, where did you set the publishing? Manage, right. manage publishing automatically comes up. Okay. And then you'll see under data management, if you don't want to do it through the output job, you can do it through the preferences as well. Um, we can. Uh, we can look at it through the data management and publishing destinations in the uh, preferences. Okay, so we generated the documentation. We can generate the assembly, which this is going to be our PCB prints. So you can see here I had three different layer sets if I was looking at what we had configured in our properties. And we'll go ahead and generate the fabrication as well, where it's going to bring up some of the files that it generates in this scenario, not very important for us. We can go ahead and close those. But you'll now see that all of your outputs are now contained within the folder structure in your project. right? So this is everything that we just generated. Now, if we want to look at what that folder structure looked like, if you really think about it, all that last 20 minutes of talk was just to create three different folders. That's all it really looks like. So if we right click on the project and hit Explore, I can now see that I have specific folders for assembly, documentation, and fabrication, where normally you would just have your one folder for project outputs. That would be the default, right? So if I go into assembly, we named it assembly drawings. So that gives us the extra level of organization per our outputs. Because once again, I don't really care to have my fab and assembly files all together. For me, I like to have it a little bit cleaner and, uh, and have it that way. So, yeah, we'll overwrite that one. Perfect. Yes? Is there a way to run all the output containers From what I know, you mean just one click everything? Yeah. I don't think so. Um, if that was the case, I feel like there would be like a, like a Staples easy button that would just be put right above the output containers. Uh, and I think the reason for that is that maybe sometimes you just don't want to generate everything at once. Um, but uh, from what I 
believe I know I've never seen a, a one button generate. There's been time where I forget one, I one and that. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah? yeah uh, I mean, the, the script, that, it, it runs all of my Right, that's custom for you, right? That's something that well, you it's, set up? It's, it's, yeah, but it's just, it's software, the, the, the uh, software that you support. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it is Altium, yeah? Okay, so you set that up custom. <laughs> When's the session on scripting? I'll be telling you right now, I will not be doing that talk. Uh, yeah, and we have now a guest speaker, all right? So, um, yeah, maybe it would be worth kind of collaborating after this as well, too, so you guys can kind of talk about it a little bit. So. Yeah. A little bit about it. You find how powerful it really is. Yeah. I'll, uh, I wasn't. Supportive. Yeah. <laughs> that the unfortunate part. Yeah. I'm not sure if you had anything additional. I just know this gentleman had his hand up here. So go ahead. Uh, you can install it at once. Yeah? Project oh, through the project releaser, yeah. <laughs> is anybody here using the project releaser? Okay, so there is, there is a few. Thank you. That's a good point. I was actually going to throw this in here a couple weeks ago but I chose not to. Through the project releaser is essentially a way to package it all up and consider it as released. If you're using any type of data management product or if you wanna have kind of like an additional step of, I don't wanna say a revision, let's call it, you can use the project releaser where it's gonna take everything that's in the output job and generate it all at once. It's gonna take everything in the output job, all the containers and everything, and it's gonna catch any errors, so if you're if in your output job you have a schematic and that schematic is trying to reference something in your project and it's not there, it'll actually stop the releaser and say, hey, I think you have a schematic document missing because I'm trying to generate something and it's giving me an error. So if we do, we may not have some time to look at the project releaser, uh, but for those of you that are interested, please come see me afterwards. It's very easy to show. Uh, thank you, once again, you do have a point. From the output job itself, there's no staple easy button. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of like this dialogue, except you can, you can have, you know, a separate sub a little bit different. Separate sub a little bit different. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and I already have my schematic, my PCB, everything's ready to rock, and I'm ready to generate my, or configure my output job. So in this scenario, I would go add existing to project, I would go find where my output job is stored, because this is the output job that we use all the time. <coughs> oh, I'm very sorry. Thank you for mentioning that. I just thought you could use your imagination and just, you know, just, just carry along with it, right? So here we would go add existing to project, and we would go find our output job. Let's see where this is stored. I don't think I saved my old output job, did I? Let's go save. Okay, let's go explore. We all put on the uh, same pair of pants at the end of the day. You know, some of us do make mistakes and I'm not afraid to admit when I make a mistake. Perfect, and we would go and find that output job. And we'd now add it to this project and we're ready to go. Does anybody see any issues with that? Does anybody know some of the concerns? I'll give you first shot because you seem very eager to answer that. I'm sorry, I seem eager. Yes, that's okay because I don't want to hear myself talk for two hours, guys. Please, please chime in. You, you think you're hunky dory, right? Yeah. So, okay, so has anybody, if I right click on this right now, this is a new project. I didn't create this output job, I just added it, right? And I explore here. What is it referencing? It's referencing the old project. It's referencing the old project. So, do you think that if I make a change to this output job, it's going to affect the output job in the other project? Right. And, uh, putting your new files where the old files Thank you. So essentially what you would do in this scenario is you can copy paste the actual output job to your new project file. And what you'll notice is that you'll get this little arrow beside, this do uh, beside arrow the icon. Is arrow is bad, thank you. So if you're gonna use this method, just make sure you're using it right. Make sure you maybe rename it, save as, save as something else. Um, <coughs> but I'm not a big fan of this method and it can get you into a lot of trouble. You created the arrow? Well, you failed, you failed the class, I'm sorry. I'll actually ask you to leave now if you don't mind. I found out I'll put you in another budget all the time until I learned about the arrow. Right. So the arrow's bad, okay? It's referencing files from another project. So here's, here's what I'm going to tell you is that you're the one using it wrong. That's what I would say, essentially is that that's now not a part of that project folder. So you can bring it up, you can save as, save it in your new project folder, you'll get rid of that arrow, okay? Now, the second method that we can use is through the uh, new document defaults. So in our preferences, if you go to system and if you go to new document defaults, you can set every time one of these documents is created or added to a project, which file it's going to use. So in this scenario, anytime I create a new project, I'm gonna go from file, I'm gonna go ahead and select the output job that we just created, so that if I remove the output job from this project, just assuming that uh, none of the, that I don't have any output jobs in this project, and I add new, I'll now see that I'm bringing up the output job that I just created. So this means that every time I add an output job, I don't have to reconfigure it. Did I have NC Drill? Did I have Gerbers? Were they the right configuration? Right, so this is something you can really need to consider using this new document default. New document default, preferences, system, new document defaults. This doesn't just go for output jobs, this goes for anything that was in that list. I can bring it up very briefly again. So what you'll see is document kind, uh, PCB project. So anytime I add anything to a project, that's what's going to pop up. But if, so it, it grabs oh, a template, basically. Correct. Uh, it's now, it's now, now a, it's, it's actually, to the correct, so it's actually bringing in the existing out job document. It's not necessarily saved as a template. It's a way that you are essentially creating it as a template and reusing it. But it's still referencing the document itself. So system, new document defaults.
But if we have free documents, if you just want to add a PCB or add whatever, that's where you would store it under this category here. So it's much different than doing it through the PCB project. So is there a copy of the output job in the project folder, or is there a preference in your template folder? No, there, in this scenario, I have an arrow, and this is for demo purposes, because I didn't rename it or anything like that. Uh, it will create it in the new project folder. Okay. So because you're just going add new, and it'll, it's creating it new. It's not referencing the old one. So this would be the proper way to do it. You're going you're gonna to tell me there's a better way. Well, I was going to say it's referencing or the template that you're using is an actual product. And so then if you edit that project, you're going to edit every future uh, copy of that. Correct. File. So in. So store it as a default folder. Yes. Yes. So you would essentially be saving this out job in a, let's call it a mm -hmm. templates folder. For me right now, the way my setup is, is that it's referencing a project, which is why I still have the arrow. It's still referencing the old one. So I'm currently doing it wrong based on my file management. You would have this output job saved somewhere else, whether it be on the server, under a templates folder, that you would then put that new path in there. Yeah. I just like doing things the completely wrong way, that's all. Okay, so now we can look at the project template where we can just go ahead, we'll create new project. Uh, let's see what it's going to like. We can name it, uh, I'll just call it out one, two, three. Can't do that because I've already, I've already named something that before and I didn't delete all my other stuff. So we'll go ahead, we'll add a schematic. Uh, we'll add a PCB. Once again, this is just a generic example of what your project template may look like. And once again, I have my output job set up that it's going to use the existing output job that we just had. So I can go ahead, I will save everything here. So if we go into explore, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually, this may be different for some of you, but I would just copy the project folder. Project folder. And then we can reuse this as a template, project template. We can find that in our preferences as well. For our project template, I can once again have it reference this specific path. Oops, I think I messed it up. OK. Should be able to just reference that folder. See, I make mistakes, and this is why we have cheat sheets. Perfect, in data management templates, here we go. So these are where all the default templates exist. So whenever you try and create a template or any of the templates that exist within Altium itself are gonna be found in this particular folder. So once again, I just wanna make sure that I copy the project path. Explore, let's go back. We'll copy this. Once again, based on where you're saving this, your templates may not be the default templates folder in Altium. This might be something that you have on your shared drive where you store all of your templates. So in this example, I can paste that there. Okay. Now whenever I create a new project, what do we name that out? Now we can see that it's available as a project template and I will use that template, and we can now see that this output job <coughs> exists here as well. So there was, only, there was only a few people using the preferences in the project template, right? Okay. So if you don't have anybody that's kind of administrating any of the projects, I would probably start with the default document first, and then if you have specific schematics, PCBs, and stuff like that that you're always using every time on a new project, then you can use the project template. And what I'll do is I'll close all of this for now. I can actually just close this project because we're not going to use it anymore. Now what you'll see throughout some of the talks, and you'll notice that John Watson, the presentation that's going on in the corner, is all about data management and Altium Concord Pro. Who's here, who here has heard of Altium Concord Pro? Got an email, seen it on the website, something along those lines. Okay, so is anybody familiar, and sometimes we don't bring this up, 
of when they had Altium Vault. That's, people have heard of that. Okay, so it's similar in that regard as far as a data management tool, but, uh, but it's been rebranded and it's kind of a completely other tool. So in this scenario, I would sign into my vault or you know, we're calling it Altium Concord Pro is the proper terminology for it. Now, the way that it stores all of the files in Altium Concord Pro is that it does it through a fileless manner. So you're not gonna have the issue of copying a document from another project and all this file management. You just know that it's stored within this particular interface and we can have templates here. So here we have output job templates that are already existing. It's in this interface. I don't have to go to my templates folder, uh, however I'm storing it. Everything is stored within here. And the way that you would uh, essentially reuse this is that you would have a project. This project would be uh, stored in Altium Concord Pro. So I can just go ahead and open up this project. Uh, it has some of the sample project that's included with Altium Concord Pro and go to project options, managed output jobs, and right from here, I can add the templates that I already have. So not once with Altium Concord Pro did I open up an out job, reuse an out job. It's automatically stored within the data management and you're reusing it. So those would be the methods that we would reuse the output job as a template. So some of this information hopefully is gonna be you know, new, for, new for some of you which is good based on the raise of hands. I'm hoping none of you are lying to me. Uh, but I would look at the default document first, then look at using a project template. So that's what we have for output jobs. Now, with output jobs, the only thing we looked at was the outputs. We didn't look at documentation. We didn't look at how we solved the issue of taking the PCB dimensions off of our board, uh, you know, maybe you have a maybe you have a layer stack. Does somebody put the layer stack legend on their PCB right now? You maybe have your drill drawing. You have your PCB dimensions, regions. There's kind of a couple. There's a lot of things that we can really add to our PCB. Now. We kind of want to, I don't want to say get away from that because that can still be helpful whenever you're designing, but we want to find a better way where we can represent some of that information. So how can we create drawings? How can we have dimensions and not have them on our PCB? And this is when we're going to look at the draftsman document. Mm -hmm. um, raise, a hand, raise of hands once again, draftsman document, who's using it? Good, okay. So we're going to look at the templates as well. Uh, sheet templates and document templates are being used as well. All right, 50-50, you're like, eh, maybe. So we're gonna look at that as well too of how we can save just draftman sheets and not have to reuse the whole template as a document. So essentially what the draftsman document was meant to be was a professional drawing tool for electrical and mechanical uh, information. So what we see for some of the traditional methods, once again, whenever I was very early in my career, the draftsman document did not yet exist. So the traditional methods that we were using is we were just kind of throwing everything on the PCB. And this means that we have the drill table, we have the dimensions, layer stack, and so on. But this kind of adds, A, a lot of layers to our PCB now, mechanical layers, and it adds a lot of clutter on the board. I don't really care to see all of this. Uh, I just kind of want to get the job done and send it out. So we're now cluttering the PCB depending on how much information you really have, it could affect the performance of the PCB as well. Um, but other than the assembly drawings that we looked at in the output job, assembly drawings and putting information on the PCB, there's not really much else we can do in Altium as far as documentation. So this is why they have the draftsman document. So, some of the other concerns that we see with this is that we have people that are using external tools. So for any 2D drawings or anything like that, did anybody else use AutoCAD, use another tool? Right, so now you have to work in two different tools, you have to learn two different tools, and hopefully you're maybe using a free software that you don't have to pay for, uh, but sometimes that's not always the case, right? I know some of the Autodesk products are paid services, right? Uh, and it could be anything else. It could be Microsoft Visio for a flowchart. It can be anything like that. 
So now you have to use a completely different tool. You have to relearn a completely different tool. Uh, and now you're essentially having multiple tools for the same job. And there's no intelligence or collaboration between those two tools. So, you know, mechanical tool is over here, Altium is over here, and they don't talk. They're in a, you know, a domestic dispute. They had a, a bad argument or something, right? And they don't talk. So that doesn't concern me. Using the two tools doesn't concern me. What concerns me is that what do you need to do when you have to make a change to your design? So if you make a change to your design, you change the dimensions, you add mounting holes, you now have to go back into your mechanical tool and make those changes as well. Uh, I like hopefully doing things right the first time and I don't like doing them twice. Uh, I don't know about everyone else. Some people, that's what they like, but uh, that's the big issue. So how do you plan on updating your design? That's why the draftsman document was essentially created. <coughs> What it does is that it pulls all the information directly from the PCB, and we're gonna dive into it, uh, and we're gonna see it in action, but it pulls all the information from the PCB, so there's no importing and exporting. There's nothing to have to do to bring a PDF or any mechanical dimensions, anything like that into another tool. It's in a draftsman document in Altium Designer, and it's a professional drawing tool. The great thing about it is that there's a one-click update and I'm gonna show you this, and this is essentially the bread and butter of the draftsman document. You can put all the information on there, that's great, but when you need to make a change, what do you do? That's why this draftsman document is gonna be much more efficient than using an external tool. And we're gonna see how we can reuse that as a template, and there's a reason why I showed the output jobs first, is because we can have the draftsman document information inside of the output job as well. So it's not like you have to generate it in two different spots, and uh, that's why we have it. So, once again, it's not a PowerPoint presentation. It's showing the tool. So, what we're going to do is, once again, to kind of mimic what we had with the assembly documentation and fabrication, I'm going to have three different sheets for that as well. Okay, so we have our dimensions here. Traditionally, you would go, you would place the drill table, you wouldn't have it on the top layer, so just please excuse me for that right now. I mean, you want if you want to, you can, but don't come uh, calling me whenever you have an issue. So you'll have a lot of this information on the PCB document itself, and that's not what we want. So I will go ahead and close this particular project, and we will add a draftsman document to the project that we've been working on. Once again, we can choose our templates just like we did with the PCB project, just like we did with the output job. These are the default templates that exist. Let's go ahead and select the default template for now because we're gonna add our own later on. So with the Draftsman document, the environment's very similar to what you would see in the schematic as well. You have a sheet, we have the properties panel, and we also have the place menu where we can place all of our lines, our graphics, our board views, and all that fun stuff. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with an assembly sheet, then we're gonna move to a fabrication sheet, then we'll move to a documentation sheet. So it's PCB driven, so that would be a no. Because it's gonna pull all the information from the board, the components, the board dimensions, the board views, so it's driven from the PCB. I'm sure there's still manual ways to pull in some of the schematic information, but it would be a manual process. It wouldn't be PCB driven. So in here, we're gonna start with placing a board assembly view. I wanna see what my board looks like from the top and from the bottom. So it's gonna pull everything directly from the PCB, and you'll notice it's gonna be a very accurate representation of what we have from the PCB. So if I zoom in here, if I split this vertical, we can kind of see it's pretty close to exactly what we have as far as component placement, designators, and we're gonna look at dimensions as well. <coughs> so what can we kind of mess around with in this draftsman document? So let's first take a look at, we can change the scale. Right now we have a one-to-one -one scale. We have all the scaling options through the properties menu. Maybe this is just a little bit too small. Maybe I wanna print this on a PDF and maybe I just want to have it blown up a little bit larger, we can certainly do that. How do you get the footprint to show up uh, outside the board edge? Outside the board edge? Yeah, my, my, some of my 3D models get cut off at the board edge. 
you and I are going to have to look at that later. Okay. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll look at it over lunch for you. Because okay. it's probably better if I just look at it and see yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's almost like, oh, well, this happens on this project, and this happens on this project. I'm like, it's a case to case basis. But, but you're, you did a default view, which is, uh, is a fabric. Yeah, it's an assembly view, place so assembly view. Assembly. Yeah. OK. Never mind. okay. So we change the scale there. Now, what can we change on this actual view right here? Maybe we want to have the components look a little different. Maybe we'll want to display other information. And that can all be accessed through this properties menu. So we change the scale, the title. We don't have a template yet, so we're not too concerned about that. Now, maybe we want to look at the properties. Maybe we want to look at the component display properties. So in here, we can have a couple different projections of how we want our actual components to look like. We can change them to 3D projection. We can have just the bounding box. So this kind of gives you the flexibility on how you want your components to look. We'll keep the default view. Same thing with the designators. Maybe you have designators that are too bunched up. Maybe you want to have a, surf, a certain orientation for the designators as well. So we can change this orientation in here as we see fit. And we can also go ahead and move designators around as we want. So maybe we have some uh, silk screen or some overlay or something that we need to move some stuff over. We can certainly do that, no problem. Uh, pretty sure you can. I would have to, yeah. Right here. Let's see what this will do for us. So that's just that's for the specific title. I would have to go into it and change the properties of the component I itself. Right. Well, here, there you go. Component designator font. There you go. Com it's under the component display properties, designator font size. Let's change that back because that's a little ugly. So when it comes to the components, we can also toggle which components are surface mount devices, which one are through hole as well. So we have additional options right here. We can display surface mount devices. We can display through hole components. If we wanted to hide some components, we can go into this component uh, display properties, and we can toggle which ones we want visible and which we do not want visible, and also change their properties as well. So we have a dedicated components uh, button right there for you. Now, does the system save, the, uh, save that? Because I'm having trouble with it not saving. Uh, you know, when I do an in, another import, okay. it, I lose all the, all the default stuff that I've just done on Okay, that I'm, I'm not, I haven't dive, dove into it too, too much yet, but uh, I want you to show me that whenever we look at it. Yeah, because I'm, I'm not too sure. Too. Yeah? Okay, that it won't keep those, some of those properties? It like throws it away and goes back to some default state. Okay. I'll look at some of the cases we have just to see what the... Okay. Let me see if I can get a workaround for you for sure. So please make sure I grab some of your information later on as well, too. Please, don't, don't let me forget. Could you design some standard no-bomb parts, not-with parts, and then highlight that here? Like a few of the, the mm, that's a good question. I would have to look at the variant first, right, because that would be with some no-place. Uh, if you want to do parts that are like manually soldered, let's say, right. maybe not. We can place callouts and annotations. So I'll show that as well, too, where I have one of my components that is manually placed. So we can place notes in the callouts as far as specifically targeting the do not install parts, something I would have to dive into as well. Yeah. I'll, like I said, I can, I'm sure it exists. There's, I'm sure there's information, multiple footprints. Yeah. OK. Well, if it's a DNI, I just don't have the model. Right. Or you could, you could hide it completely from the drawing. <laughs> but then if you have 40 components that are DNI, that could be a little bit of a tedious method as well, too. There you go. Or 500, not 40, 500. Yeah, right. So I'll uh, just make sure you come up to me afterwards, and I'll for sure look into it again. Uh, so for those, yes, sir? So in the, this is for the assembly. So right now, it's just more of the documentation perspective. We'll look at fabrication. 
where I can place layer one, layer two, layer three? No? Okay. Just just the copper? Copper and components. Copper and components? So we'll look at the fabrication views, which you'll be able to see the component per, the copper per layer. We have that. The only thing is I have to look at a little bit more if I want to show the copper and the components at the same time. Okay. Okay. But this is only going to bring in uh, like regions and stuff like that. Yeah, so I don't know if it's going to bring in all of the copper. So it does, but you also may want to show all the layers as well. Just one layer at a time? Okay. Okay, so we could do it through this topology. You'd probably just have to configure the topology, but I'll show the fabrication views, and if the fabrication views are not enough for you, come see me and we'll talk about it. Okay. So in this scenario, once we have our assembly view placed, maybe we're okay with this information, maybe we want to change this title because it's massive. Now it's too small, perfect. So we could actually copy these views. It'll keep the same property. I can go ahead and paste it anywhere in this environment as well. And I can go ahead and select it and I can change this to the bottom. So here we have our orientations as well. I can flip that over to the bottom. It's not uh, cooperating with me. We'll make sure that we show all of the holes as well. There we go. We'll show all the holes on top. Perfect, and I think one of the big things too is the dimensioning and the detail views. So we can add our dimensions directly from here, place a linear dimension, and it's going to adapt the exact same information that is on the PCB currently. These dimensions are the exact same. Now we can place more than just linear dimensions as well. We can do diametral dimensions and we can do ordinate dimensions. So if I want to dimension specific holes, I have no problem doing that. We're going to select this, and it'll give us another note telling us the actual dimension. And maybe we don't want to have the dimension for all six holes. Maybe we want to just place one of these, and, uh, and in here we can essentially change the name. So we can do all six holes are that diameter. So I placed it kind of in a poor position right now. Let's see, I can just move this over. Yeah. Okay. I'll once again I'll have to I'll have to test it again. Yeah. But do you have to toggle back and forth quite a bit? So in the I think you have to change them here. I'm not sure if the Q and Control Q works for changing, like it would in the schematic and the PCB. But. I'm, I haven't tested it right now, is what I'm saying. Well, in that document option chain, you have a correct property, but I think one of the options is. Uh, you know, yeah. But he was, he was asking if there was an on the fly toggle between the two, right? Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Right. So we can also place other ordinate dimensions. I personally like this one because it gives the dimensions in between specific components. So if I want to pick the middle here, and if I want to go in between each pin, all I have to do is select these pins, and it's going to give us multiple dimensions for that. So once again, this isn't really some things that you could do in another mechanical tool that easily, uh, nor would you be able to do it in an assembly drawing or whatever the case may be. And to finish this particular assembly one, uh, I will place a isometric view just because it's 3D, gives you a better representation of what your board actually is. And I'll also place a detail view where we can see this part of circuitry up here is kind of bunched up together and depending on what my view is on my sheet, uh, it might not be sufficient for me. I want something that looks a little bit better. So I can go ahead and I can blow this up. So we can see here we get a little bit of a better view of exactly what's going on. This is a detail view. Yeah. 
And you'll see here, once again, my, just my drawing size is a little bit off. You can see it's going to reference a specific detail A. That way you know that's what it's referencing. Now, coming back to maybe placing some annotations on if we want something that is manually soldered, or maybe there's something on your PCB that's manually placed, we can go ahead and we can place a call out, and we can go right here, and we place that call out. So right now, it doesn't really tell us anything, but what we're gonna do is we will determine where it's getting the source of the text, whether it be from a bomb item, whether it be a note item, whatever the case may be. So we can say that, hey, uh, L1 is bomb item number 17. So what I'm going to do is I wanna say that it's ma uh, uh, manually soldered. So I'm gonna put a note item. It's not gonna show anything right now because I'm then going to place a note. Let's go ahead and place notes. We can see here we can get multiple notes. I will access these properties. I will delete number two and three because they are not necessary for me right now. In number one, I can say that a one is placed manually. And we can say there, and this is going to reference no item, and it's going to reference no item number one. So we know that whenever we're looking at that, we can see that L1 is gonna reference that note. We look at our notes, and we know that it's to be placed manually. I would assume that you would just have to place two of them. So I would just go ahead and place another call out on that component, okay. one that would reference the bomb and one that would reference the note. Mm -hmm. Stop it. You can have multiple arrows. Mm, I'm, not, I'm not picking up what you're putting place, down. Place, place a, a call out. Yep. And then come off of it. Sure. That's what I was saying. You, have to, you would have to place two separate ones. No, you, you don't terminate. If you don't terminate, it will allow you to put another um, reader line in. Okay. Yep. Don't terminate it. Okay. The text, now, 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 the text number one time, and now it should allow, yeah, there, there's your other. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found that out by accident. Okay. <laughs> by accident. It's always a good way to find out. <laughs> well, as I long as it doesn't cost you anything. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, of, because it, it puts multiple lines on there also. Right. So I, I don't really know what it's good for. But. Yeah. Yeah. So you can like specifically talk about the component properties like So for this particular one and I haven't like I said I haven't looked at it too too much <laughs> through the call out itself it's only the bomb item. So I don't know if you can reference the um, the parameter of that component in the bomb. So it would just say like 17, and then you would have to go in your bomb and look at what you have for your bomb. That's for the call out. So if I change this here to a bomb item, it would then say, and the bomb's not set up right now, but it would say bomb item number 17. And those, like that bomb item 17, mm -hmm. the Correct. Okay. Yeah. So in this scenario, we're good for the assembly. We would now look at the fabrication. So I can go in here and I can just add another sheet. It's not like you need to have multiple draftsman documents. Yep. Let's go back to the uh, call out area. Yep. Where you rule up uh, section value one. If you yep. Modification in there like add a line and put a call out to say, like, I want to two components together. I assume we can essentially place a call out on the detail. And then in here, I would do. Yeah, like a symbol of some sort or an image. You could place an image if you wanted to as well. Yeah. So for the fabrications, and maybe I can talk on the layers a little bit for you here as well. Would this be sufficient for you, or would you need the component information as well? Yeah, I need some components. Okay. 
Okay, so we'd probably have to look at a little bit more in, pardon me? Yeah, so it probably, yeah, could do that as well. So we'd just have to configure some of these views, but what you guys are saying, it should be able to give you all the information you need. So for fabrication, once again, we can just place whatever we'd like here, whether it be multiple layers, and we can change these layers on the fly as well. And it's gonna pull all the information directly from the PCB. Okay. For fabrication? Wrong guy to ask. We do have some product development people here this week. Um, and you would look on the forums for anything for draftsmen related if they're going to be improving that. I, I don't have insight to that. I, I would, ha once again, I have to go back and look at the actual technical issues. Just in the draftsman, right? No. Pardon me, sorry? Okay. From the extent if you have specifications on like solder mask, Clearance and stuff like that. Mm. You guys have some good questions today. Right. Would you be doing that currently in the PCB document itself? In the assembly drawing. Okay. I'll have to once again. Let me look at that, but please, please come back to me, and we'll see. I know for the solder mask itself, um, there's never really too much flexibility on it for that particular thing. Um, so on the top of my head, I want to say no, but I definitely want to look into it, okay? The other thing for the fabrication, last thing we'll kind of place that I think is personally kind of cool is we can place the layer stack right in here as well. It's gonna take in all the information of all the layers we can change this to kind of be rescaled as well, but we can place all of this information in this draftsman document. So for fabrication, that's, yes, sir. Yep. Okay. Oh, that was because I was just scrolling with my mouse there. That's why it went a little bit out of whack. I picked the wrong thing. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> how, do you add, how do you quickly add this another sheet? Uh, Right-click menu. Yep. Okay. That's okay. So we'll head to documentation. The one thing I really like with the bill of materials is that um, if you have a bill of materials that has more than X amount of components, you can actually split the bomb up into separate sections. I'm sure some people are already using that. For those of you who are using the draftsman document, do you use your bomb in the documentation? It's too big? All right, it's good. I might be able to solve that issue. So here I'm gonna go in and I'll place the bill of materials. In this scenario, I have a pretty small bomb. We see in our component maybe only had 20 or 30 components. So in here, in the bill of material properties, I can limit the height. So if I limit the page height, it's cut out half of my components. So I mean, that's cool, but okay. Okay. Yeah, like you're probably, you may not even, you might be using the Excel template anyways to do your bill of materials. But maybe if you have an assembly house, like what I used to have in house is that I was the bridge between the design and the assembly and everything was done in house, soldering and everything. So I could have given them this documentation to say, here's a list of the bill of materials. I could have printed out the Excel sheet. I could have done it either way really. 
but this is more of a simplified graphical representation where that might not work for you or you don't do anything in-house in that regard and you're gonna send out your Excel sheet anyways or you're send it to procurement because what's procurement gonna do with this, right? They want the Excel sheet, something that they can import into their uh, purchasing system. But in this scenario, if you just want a visual representation of the bill of materials and it's too large, we can change the page, uh, we can change the page itself. So if you limit the height, we can always go and we can just copy paste right here. And if our bomb ends up exceeding that limit of 200 components, 300 components, we can easily split this up. Okay. Yep. So you want to, do you want to show and hide different parameters? Oh, like the way it's grouped. Right, so what you would do when you generate your bill of materials, uh, let's say if you want to have it by designator because you want to have every component on that list. Or if you want to have all the components grouped based on their part number, right? So, <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'd, I'd have to look at the grouping capabilities of the bomb itself. If you go in here and we go columns, it's going to show specific uh, columns, but as far as the grouping, I would have to look at what's capable for the actual grouping of the parameters and everything. Because you don't want to have 10 different light items, you want to have one because your test points are all the same. Correct. Right, so I'll have to look at how the, what are the grooming, grouping capabilities of the bomb itself in Draftsman, because I know it's possible through the Excel, Excel document, for sure. And just for this, this documentation, we'll go ahead, we'll place a drill table, and it's gonna pull everything over from the PCB. Uh, you can actually place your own table as well, and if you wanna copy paste information, uh, that is a possibility as well, where you can place your own table in there. Uh, no problem at all. So assuming that you have all of your information on a bunch of different sheets and you don't want to hear me talk about it for an hour to place everything and you just want to reuse it, we can obviously ha save it as two different templates. We have a sheet template where I can save specific views on a specific sheet and I can also do a uh, drawing template where it's going to save the entire document as a template itself. So just like we would see in a schematic template as well, uh, I have a template, maybe you wanna put your company name, your company image, whatever the case may be. This would be a .dws, that is the uh, sheet template, and we can apply that to our sheet here. Once again, if we go into template, and if we, we can change this as we wish. In this scenario, I don't have my Draftsman template saved within the templates folder. Remember how we looked at yes, uh, earlier, where we can go save, save as, and we can save it as templates. So let's just go ahead, we'll save this in here, see what we can do. And we'll save it as a sheet template. And we'll put this, yeah, we'll put it there. And then if we go into Draftsman, so remember how we looked at the default documents for Draftsman? It's under its own category, so you don't necessarily have to play around with the, uh, the other ones. So in here, let's go and save our, okay. Perfect, let's see what this gives us. So I can now use that template for this particular sheet. So that's how we would apply a sheet template and then we could also save this out as a sheet template as well. So if I wanted to save it as a sheet, we just go save as, save as sheet just like I did. Now, if we want to save the entire document itself as one big template that we can reuse at all times, we can go File, Save As, 
and we're going to save it as a draftsman document template. Now, here's the one caveat. Anything that's particular to this source document, this PCB, whether it be specific dimensions, those are all going to be removed. And the reason for that is that if you want to reuse this template in another project, those dimensions are obviously not going to be applicable to your new project. So what this is giving you is a notification saying, hey, I have to remove some of the stuff that's specific to the PCB. So we'll go ahead and click OK. And we'll notice that some of the stuff will disappear, such as some of my dimensions and whatever the case may be. And now we're able to reuse this document as a template. But that'll still bring in all of the views. It'll bring in the views, correct. Yeah, so I've already saved it out as a template right now. And it kept the views. It kept everything. So it now used this document as my template. For, yeah, for this here. But I know the linear dimensions were gone. But, uh, you know, there you go. I just showcased it, right? Yeah, so uh, for the most part, it is pretty good, though. It's just it will have to remove some of those other things. So we can also, just like we did previously for the preferences, um, for the templates, any time that we start a new draftsman document, we can reuse this template. So if I go ahead, let's explore this. And we'll take this, copy, templates, paste. We can now see that this poly template's now available for us to use every time. So the biggest thing about the Draftsman is that A, you don't have to use another tool. B, there's the automatic update, and we can reuse it as a template. So the last thing I want to show with the Draftsman document is the automatic update. So in the scenario that I go and I rotate this component and I make some changes, I can go into the Draftsman document, right click. It didn't like my zoom. And I can import the changes. And we can now see that these components have been rotated and moved, and any of the views will be updated as well. So that's something that you're not able to do in another document or another tool. And this is not really flexible within the assembly drawings aspect. And that automatic update is what's only going to have you do it once. OK, so that's pretty much what I have for you today um, for the templates. If there's anything that I can probably give you as a takeaway, and I'll, ex I'll show you my personal experience one last time. The good news about this, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that you guys are going to learn from me. And the bad news is, is that you guys are really going to know how much I didn't know earlier in my career. So I have some sample PCBs with me today, uh, some of the projects that we've done. I used to work for a company called Genetech Radio Technologies, and they do uh, they design products for underground mining applications. So we have cap lamps and radios for underground miners. We have proximity systems and uh, RFID systems as well. In-house is where uh, we did all of our assembly. So anything that has to do with connectors, soldering components, we didn't get any of that shipped out as far as the assembly. So all the components that we got in-house were soldered by hand. Some of these projects were uh, sent out depending on the complexity of them. But I'd say about 75% of them were done manually in our assembly house. The people that we had doing the assembly were not PCB designers. They're not engineers. They're people who are doing labor and putting these boards together. So how was I able to tell them, here's how you have to place this component. Here's how you have to place this connector. And what I essentially did is I created an assembly manual in a Word document because we didn't have any other tools to do it. And although that got the job done, it necessarily wasn't the most efficient way to do it. And I couldn't give them the exact information. I found it super tough to like place dimensions and notes and all this stuff freely within a Word document. I don't know if it's just me or if I'm not a Word expert, but uh, doing the assembly manuals in Word was not fun. 
And at this time, I, didn't, I don't know if the draftsman document was out, but I didn't know it existed. So I could have given them instructions, I could have given them notes, I could have given them the bill of materials. And if there's anything I can ask from you guys today is to probably be, don't be like me, is to be better than me and ask if there's a way that, a better way that we can be doing it. And this is with the draftsman document. So I went through those challenges and I didn't know that these things existed at the time um, and I could have used it. So if there's anything I can kind of share with you guys today is always ask the question if there's a better way to do it. Um, and you'll see that as well in the mechanical presentation that we're doing after lunch as well too. So uh, I will invite all of you to come up and uh, share your questions. We're coming up on lunch very shortly. We do have a little bit of time as well. Uh, if you guys want to check out some of the PCB samples I have too, you're more than welcome to come and discuss. For those of you who still want answers to your questions, I know there's still a select few of you, please, please come see me if you want those answers. Uh, I will stick around here for the next half hour at the very, very, very least. So thank you. It's a lot to talk about. And uh, go enjoy some lunch. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you.